Today we're going to talk about Project 3. And uh, so although your Project 2 is due this Friday, but I wanted to, to release this because then you'll have more time. Because all, like, anyways, uh, the time is a little bit limited. And uh, it, I think it's better to have it released. So you're probably not going to work on it maybe this week. Uh, but then right after you're done with PA2, you have to like, you know, start working on it. Um, and again, we reduced the workload a little bit. So it's relatively easier than it was going to be, but it's not very easy. Still, you need a lot of work, right? So uh, last session, we covered file system, and we're going to continue uh, like storages uh, in, uh, on Thursday and as well next week. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I hope everyone is done with all the you know work. I mean, again, your timeline is that you should be done with the implementation and now should basically be debugging and working on the robustness tests and not the functionalities anymore. I mean, maybe a couple of, you know, system calls or issues, but mostly uh, you should be done with that. Um, you have like two grace days that you can spend on this project. Make sure you use them wisely and, you know, work hard with your group mates because, again, you might also need those uh, if, if you actually get it done before uh, Saturday, then you can save the second grace day for Project 3. So, uh, and the auto grader is also open. I didn't check if people, like, you know, do you have submitted anything or not. If not, just start submitting. Um, just a hint, there might be uh, some slight difference, depending on your uh, implementation, there might be a difference between what you get on your machine and on auto grader. Even on your machine, if you, I think, run it, you know, another time, you may have a different result. I think we have had uh, a couple of the students like ha had like random fails. So we're not going to catch it. Uh, so it's up to you. So, you know, if you run it multiple times, do make clean and make again. If you get like, you know, different results, make sure, you know, you also get the higher result on the auto grader, right? So if you get, I don't know, some grade on your machine, but then you submit it on auto grader and it's a little bit lower, and that's what you have seen on your machine that sometimes it goes enough. So then just submit it again, right? So then we also pick the highest score, right? Uh, this is due to some randomness in some of the tests. It's not completely repeatable. I think if you run it with box instead of Cuomo, it might be the, the, the same. There is a couple of parameters that does that, uh, but if for some reason you're always getting some grade which is lower on auto grader than your machine, then send us an email immediately. I mean, not immediately, it doesn't matter. As long as your code is on auto grader, we can take it and we can manually grade it. We can even ask you to bring your machine and then we grade it on your machine, you know, um, just in case something like that happens, right? So, but make sure at least your code is on auto grader because we will pick that, all right? So, um, Today we're going to talk about project three after project one and two. Uh, we're going to talk about virtual memory. I hope everyone uh, <coughs> learned last couple of weeks, uh, two, three weeks actually, from memory and virtual memory. So as all as the previous projects, we're going to go over some preparations, uh, understanding a little bit about uh, what's going on in Pintos, the files that are important, uh, and uh, implementation and testing, which is a little bit specific to this project. So pay attention. If you have any questions, make sure you, you know, raise it here. It's uh, different than the Pintos documentation and Pintos grading uh, as we have, you know, tailored it a little bit. Um, yeah. So this was the whole picture of Pintos. If you remember, uh, there was some uh, support code that was given. Then the pieces that, you know, you, you are supposed to implement alongside all the four projects and the test files that uh, some of them are in the kernel, some of them are in the user space, and then test your kernel from there, right? So again, you started from the bare uh, Pintos uh, code with just like the kernel test. In the project one, you implemented some, uh, uh, some, of, uh, some pieces like he, uh, alarm clock and uh, priority scheduler. And then on pro uh, project two, you started uh, with these tests for uh, file system and robustness, and then you implemented these pieces to pass. Now you're basically here, and then you want you want to uh, implement is these pieces: uh, memory uh, management, uh, virtual memory management, page replacement or swapping, memory map files. Okay, and uh, so 
the virtual memory, as we have uh, talked about in class, is a mapping or basically removing the idea that you need to have enough memory on your physical memory to service all the user programs that you run. Okay. So far, uh, I think in uh, most of the cases in your uh, Pentos, you running, you've been running one user process, and that user process also has not been huge, right? Um, and you haven't actually gone out of memory. There's only one test in Project 2, like the OOM test, that you know, spawns a lot of processes and see if your kernel goes out of memory. Uh, but normally, you are bound to the physical memory on your Tintos machine. Uh, and in Project 3, you want to remove that. You want to have like, virtual memory implemented. So the total uh, amount of memory that is nominally requ required by your user processes is going to be more than what you actually have on your Pintos machine, right? So uh, as a preparation, you will have to understand the concepts in memory and virtual memory. Um, and again, the Pintos documentation is, uh, you know, let's say the Bible of Pintos, basically, most of the things that you need is in the Pintos documentation. I'm not going to say most of the things you need, but uh, a lot of the things that you actually need to understand the code or, you know, what is happening or where to start or, you know, help you design, a lot of it is in the Pintos documentation. It's just like that you don't catch it. Um, I keep repeating this just because I, I feel it may help, you know, a few more students every time you repeat, and that is... It's, it's, it's still worth it to go back to the Pintos documentation, to the parts that you've already uh, read. Because now you have a different perspective, now you have more questions, now you can easily see some more answers there. So, uh, you know, it's also concise, it's really useful, all right? And uh, so Project 3 depends on a correct implementation of Project 2 because it needs the system calls. Uh, because, uh, again, the tests are in user program, uh, user uh, space. And uh, it requires the Project uh, 2 implementation. However, most of you are not done with Project 2. Even if you're done, you're not getting 100. Even if you're getting 100, your code is, might ha still have some bugs, right? Uh, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to actually start from a repo which has a complete implementation of PA2. And you, like that will be given to all of you. And then you're going to basically start from there. So your base repo this time is not the, you know, base repo that you have started with. So it's not the, if you start from the uh, fresh virtual ma machine that we have you know, provided and download that, you cannot start working on your PA3. Just remember that you have to clone your repo. Um, but, um, so yeah, that will be given to you on Monday because before that people are still submitting PA2 so we can't provide that. But again, you don't need that to get started with your PA3. For PA3 you need to Get, understand the code, you need to you know, see whatever. The, the parts that are actually in the code specifically for implementing PA2, those are not necessarily needed for your design and implementation of PA3. They are needed to test them, right? So you can start reading the code of the, you know, the base code that you already have just to see what's going to happen, where is the page table, you know, how the page fault is getting handled, whatever. But if you want to actually start implementing, you need that repo and you've got to like wait till next Monday. Um, so it already passes all the Project 2 tests and in your implementation of PA3, they should still pass those tests. Okay, we're going to talk about it in the grading part. And uh, the GitHub Classroom, you have to again form it. Uh, we're probably going to transfer the groups again and there is an issue with GitHub Classroom, I don't know why. Uh, we cannot transfer from PA2 to PA3, so we're going to like, transfer from PA1 to PA3. So anyone who had any change in from PA1 to PA2 or from PA2 to PA3, your groups will be destroyed and you have to just start over creating your groups and join. Uh, there are not so many of you, but again, it's your responsibility to make sure your groups are correct. You have to make sure that all your group mates are in the group. Sometimes uh, we've seen that a GitHub repository is there, but like one of the members has not joined it. Okay, even if you're not, even if you're working together on one computer and, you know, committing together from one uh, machine, still join the repo. That helps us, you know, to see who is like within which group, 
It's already a little bit of a mess in the GitHub classroom. I don't know why it's not really user friendly. So make sure that's the case. Both on AutoGrader and GitHub Classroom. This also happened in design documents of PA2. If you don't ask your groupmates to confirm their membership, and if you don't confirm, either the AutoGrader does not allow you to submit, which then that means you have a late penalty, which is like you know losing a grace day, or lose the grade itself, or even if you will submit, it will be as an individual. So if he doesn't join my group and I will submit, even if it accepts my submission, then we will grade it only for this person. They will get a zero. So if you are that person, join the group. If you are this person, ask them to join. Simple, right? Um, so let's get into some of the, uh, like refresh uh, some of the concepts on a virtual memory and uh, talk about Pentos, all right? So, virtual memory uh, and uh, virtual address. If you remember, from the perspective of a user space, the, vi uh, the memory is all theirs. They only see memory, uh, you know, belonging to them, and they think that they can access, you know, anywhere on it. Uh, from the perspective of operating system, however, it's different. The operating system knows the limitation of the physical memory. The operating system knows that there are more than one user processes on the system. Uh, the operating system knows that, uh, you know, the user process cannot access anywhere that they want, but they have to specifically allocate memory and then, you know, access only within that allocated memory, okay? So the virtual address is basically a physical address in the eyes of a process. So a process thinks that, okay, the address of space is from uh, zero to all the way to the 4 GB, and, uh, you know, they can uh, allocate whatever, wherever they want, and uh, they can access it. And then, uh, basically, we expect a well-behaved process to not access outside of their allocated memory. However, uh, you know, we, as an operating system, we also manage to uh, handle those. But anyways, so virtual address is what they think. So, <clears throat> the physical address is when we translate that into the physical RAM modules on your, you know, motherboard or, you know, the simulators, right? So that would be the physical address. This is a distinction. There will be a mapping, and we're going to talk about it. So a page fault is when a process tries to access a memory that is not allowed to. Either it's not allocated or it's an outside of its like, you know, uh, scope. Maybe it's like kernel memory. Uh, maybe it's like beyond uh, the limitations that they have, for example, in their segments. Whatever that happens, it's called a page fault. Okay. You remember, we have implemented paging. So that means there are chunks in memory here. In the, uh, in the virtual uh, address space, and there are chunks in the physical. They're all equal. These are called pages. A section in virtual memory, 4K in this case. We have also frames, a section of physical memory. Again, 4K, matching the same size. Different in numbers, obviously, because this is like 4 GB, and the physical uh, address space is probably, you know, smaller. Not on your machine, it might be even larger than that, but in a 32-bit system, it can be definitely smaller. In the Pintos case, by default, it's 4 megabyte, right? So you only have a 1,000 frames, and you have a million pages. So the mapping between the, the, these is what the vir virtual um, memory mapping is, um, implementation is handling, right? So... When a page fault uh, is happening is uh, basically when a process is trying to address a page which is not mapped to any frame on physical memory, for example, right? So a page table is the table of pages each process has that keeps track of which pages has been allocated to it. So a page table is the mapping between the pages of a one process and the physical frames. It is per process. Each process has its own page table because... Different processes may have different pages. They may have the same index page. They can use, uh, both of the processes or many processes can use page number 1000. Of course, on the physical memory, it will be mapped to different frames. So in their page table, index 1000 will have different values, right? But uh, 
again, the page table is per process. Now, frame table is something unique for the operating system globally. Stores information about the frames you have allocated from the memory. So, again, if there are different indexes of page number 1000 for different processes, but here you should be able to tell, okay, frame number 250 is allocated to that process, frame number you know, 300 is allocated to that process, and possibly even be able to tell which page. So the frame table is like, you know, keeping key information about the available frames and uh, the use frames, right? And uh, so this is for the operating system to be able to tell. For example, if you need to allocate a new page for one, one of the processes into physical memory, you need to find a free frame in the first place. Later on, if you want to evict a frame from the physical memory, right? You have to know who this uh, <clears throat> frame belongs to. Because if you want to evict this, if it's dirty, you will write it, whatever. But you need to update the page table. So who, who does this you know, belong to? So then you have to basically point. You cannot like, parse all the pages for all the processes to find where is that like, frame. So it helps you, you know, track it back. So swap is writing and reading between the memory and the disk. Okay, so remember when you start your pro uh, uh, operating system, the RAM is empty and everything is basically on the storage, secondary storage, right? In this case, let's say the uh, file disk, right? And uh, so you, you have to anyways read from the file disk into memory. That happens already in your load and load segments in the process.c, okay? Now, the swapping is when you want to write and read between the memory and the disk to handle the virtual memory. So if your virtual memory is, uh, you know, the virtual address space is much larger than the physical address space, and you want to juggle the pages in a way that the processes don't understand that it's happening, you have to swap in and out. So basically you have the limitation of your physical memory, and now if you have too many pages and you don't have free frames to allocate, then you pick one of the fr uh, frames that is not being used uh, with an algorithm, let's say LRU, clock, whatever, and then you have to evict this page and write it down. But you don't, it's not necessarily uh, you know, a file stored in your hard disk that you can just load again. It might be a dirty page. It might, it might be still in use like later on, whatever. So there is always a swap area separately on your disk that uh, it's not like files anymore. It's just like a, a block of space that you can just keep writing into it. So this is called swapping. If you evict a page from frames, uh, physical memory, into the swap area, you are swapping out and basically creating uh, or freeing up space on your physical memory. If for some reason a process wants to access their uh, memory which you have evicted, and it, it's now on the swap area, you have to swap in. Read from the, the hard disk and ba back to memory. Now, in order to do this, you also need a swap table. This is different than page table and different than frame table, okay? So, <clears throat> the swap table basically keeps track of which pages are written in which section of disk. So, I, I said that, okay, we have a, like a block device here on your disk, which has, let's say, you know, uh, one GB of data, or one GB of basically free space initially, right? Now, because you are evicting pages of four kilobytes from page to physical frames and from physical frames to swap area. Again, your swap area is also chunks of four kilobytes. How, so that, that's like so many, like four, uh, no, like 250,000 swap slots, all right? Now, first of all, you have to keep track of which one of them are not used and free. Then when you swap out, you want to basically be able to pick one of the slots and then write the data from the physical page into them and then be able to tell, okay, which one of these slots are used and for which of the processes on which pages, right? So for this, you need the swap table, right? The same thing that you do with the frame table for physical memory is basically for swap. Any questions on any of these? Hmm? Hmm? Good. So, this is the virtual address space where the user uh, program C 
uh, up to physical ba- uh, phase based address mem- uh, space is up to theirs so they can you know basically allocate memory in here they have a stack usually like allocated right uh, uh, below the phase base they have like code segments started at like 0, 8, 0, 0, whatever, 8, 4. That's uh, like a, you know, a specific uh, configured number. Uh, then they have, you know, all the other pieces that they, they will allocate. And then they think that, you know, the operating system, uh, when they're trying to access that memory, is the same. However, uh, what they see as kernel space, and it's like above user stack, so your kernel code basically runs on them, of course, with the, you know, privileged access. It's actually not above the FIS base because you don't have 4 GB of that data. But actually, it starts from, uh, on your physical memory, it starts at the base of it. Because no matter how much your memory is, you need the kernel space, right? So your kernel code actually is uh, based here. And uh, all these pages of user memory are basically, you know, some uh, allocated to some uh, uh, some of the frames over there. And uh, again, your uh, executable is, uh, first resides on the disk, and then uh, during your process, exec- uh, process execute and start process and load and whatever you've gone through, your argument passing, you've already seen that we, as a kernel, we allocate memory here for the user, and then we load pages, you know, one by one from the disk, as uh, executable, we allocate a one page for user stack, we set up the stack and everything, right? So, this, the, the, and then the mapping, you have not seen it, but basically whenever the, get, uh, the, get, the palloc you call, you are allocating a frame here in the free, uh, free frames, and then you are allocating, uh, you're basically given a pointer which is on the virtual memory address. Usually, at least, Normally, you should not have dealt with the physical address because you, so far you haven't needed it. Whenever you get a palloc, it already basically gets a free frame. It updates the page table of you, you know, your process, your current context, and then you also will be given your virtual memory. So if you uh, use a, a palloc and then, um, you know, this right here, your pointer, again, also is pointing here because the page table is updated. So whenever you try to access this memory in hardware, it will access the page table and then translate it there. Can you know what the physical address is? Yes. As kernel, you have access to basically uh, translate the virtual address to the physical address. But again, so far, you don't need it. When you want to actually manage your virtual memory address and a frame table, for example, you will need it. Okay? Now, what is the um, map, mapping of these? So first, uh, the kernel space actually mapping is easy. It's one-to-one. Right? So, it's actually written also here. So, the uh, physical address for a kernel page is just the kernel virtual address minus phase base. So, the first page here is first page here, right? You just like subtract the phys base and you have the physical address. For user virtual memory uh, uh, addresses, that's not the case. You have to look at the page table to see, you know, where is the mapping, okay? So, uh, in Pentos, this is what you see. Again, it's the same thing, virtual memory in the uh, perspective of the user virtual addresses is user first, up to 3 GB, and then kernel space. Physical memory, the kernel space is the first GB, uh, and then the user, right? So, again, you're going to use the file system. Some of these slides actually are going to be the same as, you know, project two because they're basically the same. So you're still going to like have the file disk, create, format, whatever, because again, your tests are going to happen in the user space, right? So just uh, make sure that, you know, you don't mess with the file system again. Just like uh, do it as before. Uh, you still have to basically uh, work the same exact way. You know, your tests are limited, again, uh, in size and file name and whatever. If you want to modify a test file, you still can do, the, you can, you still can do so. Uh, again, these are uh, the, the things that you need. Um, these are also upla- updated, so I guess you can just like directly also copy and paste these. Uh, if you, I mean, at this point, you should not have any issue with these, uh, but 
Again, for PA3, it's easier to set up a couple of scripts that does these for you. So when you call this script, it, I don't know, removes the previous file disk, create it, format it, you know, copy the test file that you want. So, you know, you don't end up uh, having issue. Remember uh, that you need to compile your examples or your tests so your tests will actually get compiled whenever you are in the VM folder user proc, but your examples don't. If you want to copy an example, you have to like you know manually make sure that you make them so the binaries exist. Okay. So for uh, project three, you have uh, the you still, you still have the user proc folder, and you need to work on them because you uh, want to update and modify the process that's see an exception that C. Actually, part of the project three is within the system call, but we're going to skip it. Uh, the VM is basically what you have, which you need to implement a lot because it's like it's currently empty. It's just like a make file, and you have to create your own files, header files, C files there, and then add them to the uh, basically build system, right? So the fi the files that you need to understand first of all is the page table entry and the virtual address that H. They are in the thread folder. Uh, they, they basically help you understand how the, um, you know, addresses are. Uh, you have like page directory and page level, you have like two level paging. Uh, and the page directory and page, uh, I mean, that's CNH, they are in the user prog. The, and I think you may have seen them already in uh, project two. If not, that's fine. I think you've, uh, you've used uh, a couple of them. So to call, like, you know, if this, address is valid, if it's like, a, you know, uh, belong to a user space, whatever. So you still need a little bit more of that in your project three. And then you have to understand what the PALOC uh, functions do, because that's the way that you get the frames and then update the page tables and everything, right? So probably you have just used the functions, but for project three, you have to understand these uh, files. There is block.cnh which helps you access the block um, block of uh, you know the storage disk for swapping. However, again, you're probably not going to need it. Uh, process.cnh, a lot of the implementation is going to happen in uh, process.c and exception.c. Uh, syscalls probably you're going to ignore, and uh, exception.c and uh, exception.h is uh, again in the user proc and uh, you have to modify the page fault handler, okay? So, for the design document, again, just like last time, uh, the VM template, you just copy it into text, do not convert it into document, do not convert it into PDF, just like text file, right? Uh, don't mess with the header, just let it be like that, you just like update them, and then there will be uh, the rest of the design, like you're already familiar with it. For your project three, some of the questions will be removed because they're not related to what you're going to implement. So it's make sure you take the, te the template from the repository that we will provide to you, okay? Because that basically doesn't have some of the questions. If you get it from the website or something, you will have the other questions as well, all right? Uh, the survey questions are going to be there. I don't know if you filled it for PA2 or not, but uh, after PA2 submission, I'm going to actually again have a different form for PA2. Please for, uh, fill in that because, again, in your, whenever you're submitting your design documents, you don't have the full perspective. After implementation is important, your uh, opinion is, uh, actually matter. Um, so make sure you submit that. So back to the uh, Project 3 implementation now. So there are three parts in uh, Project 3. One is uh, managing supplementary page table and managing, you know, frames. Second is uh, the swapping. And third is memory map files. So in your Project 3, you, we are going to only do the first part, which is managing supplementary page table and uh, frames, right? So we're going to ignore swapping and we're going to ignore memory map files. Okay, we're going to talk about them slightly today, at least to know what is part of the you know Pentos project and uh, what is to be done. So first of all, whatever that you're doing in VM folder, because again you're creating a new C file or a header file, it's not in the build system. It's not going to like do make right. So what's going to uh, you're going to like uh, modify the make file that build in the source directory and in line 64 
you already see that it says like no virtual memory code yet. As a comment, it says like, you know, VM source is VM slash file dot C, you know, some file. So whatever file that you introduce in your VM directory or basically anywhere else, you have to, you know, um, let the make file know about it, right? This is the way to do it. So because it's a part of the VM source file, right, in your project free, so the, it has to be in the VM uh, SRC environment variable, right? And the way that you do is like, you know, if you create a new file, let's see, you, if, like, if you uncomment this, VM SRC is equal to this, and the consequent, like, uh, not the consequent, uh, the next file basically is going to be plus equal. Make sure you, you know, the first file should be equal, but then you're adding files to this environment variable, so don't mess this up, okay? They're all, they're all the other files for, you know, project one, two, and four, so you definitely you can see the examples, but this is the way to do it, all right? So, first part is managing supplemental page table. So, what is the supplemental page table? So, the page table currently implemented is for the hardware to find, uh, you know, a page uh, index and then translate it into a frame address. That does not have anything to do with the virtual memory, right? Because if you don't have a page available in physical memory, okay, where is it? Is it allocated to the user space? Is it in the disk? Is it in swaps? No one knows. It's not in the page table, simple page table that, uh, you know, CPU accesses to translate, right? The flags are not like, you know, going to uh, contain all the information that you need. So, in order to do this, basically you're going to uh, have a supplement page table. Uh, it's the same as the page table, but they call it supplement, so just, to, you know, you don't confuse it with whatever that exists right now, okay? And uh, so, there are things that you need to keep track of. So for each page, you have to have the information that, you know, if it's allocated or not. And, you know, if it's allocated, uh, where is it? Is it like, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the physical memory? If it's not, in the, is it in the swap? Where in the swap? Whatever. Even, like, you're, you're going to skip the swap parts, of course. But at least, you know, you have to have the idea that, you know, what is this supplement page table? It's just like, you know, more information available to the kernel. So in case that it wants to figure out what's going on, is the user accessing a correct address, a valid address or not, it will read it from that page table, all right? So when a page fault happens, this example we went over during the lecture. Uh, a page fault would mean either the user is trying to access a null pointer or a, you know, a kernel address or a, you know, a page that it hasn't uh, allocated. When you implement page as uh, virtual uh, memory, basically you're uh, allocating more uh, space to the user than you are actually having physical, right? So that means in your physical f page table, whenever like your CPU tries to access it, there are pages that are not in the page table. They're not like, you know, physically available. So these also cause a page fault. However, in this case, the page fault does not mean a bad address. Right? So that's why you need to modify the page fault handler to figure out it was a bad address or it was a not present page. In which case you just like bring it into it. Alright? So, uh, again, even if you have modified pay, uh, page fault handler for your PA2 for the safe memory access, you still have assumed any page fault is a bad memory, either on the user or on the kernel. In the kernel case, you handle it so that your kernel doesn't crash. That's fine. But still, you assume it's a bad address and then it's passed to your system call handler. In this case, that's not true. Right? So, in, uh, it, you, when, once you actually implement your, your supplemental page table, in the page for handler, in this uh, exception, let's see, you, you need to actually check your supplemental page table to figure out if the memory reference is valid but not present, then you should load the page. If it is not valid, then you terminate. How you can figure out? There will be enough information for you available. And of course, again, you should have your page table, supplemental page table to, you know, bookkeep whatever you need in that case. And in the page fault handler, first, uh, if you're not terminating the uh, process, that means it's, uh, you know, it's accessing a valid address, but it's not present in the uh, memory, then you have to like, obtain a frame to store the page. Normally, 
you have to find uh, a frame which is free and if not you have to evict a page swap it out to make it free uh, in your project you don't need to do that and then you have to fetch the data uh, and then basically for example if you're loading a file that it's you know the executable file that uh, the process actually needs but you haven't loaded because you you know wanted to implement virtual memory so then you read it uh, into the frame and then continue just return and then you continue the instruction right you also need to point a page table entry for defaulting a virtual address to the physical page so basically uh, we, you need again to bookkeep and update the page tables uh, in your supplementary data as well all right so let's see the second part is the managing uh, the frames again you need to implement these right because uh, if you want to know which frames are available, at least, right, you have to have this. So, a lot of, uh, you are still working on PA2, so I understand uh, a lot of the details might be lost, but come back to these lecture notes, and starting this week's recitation, uh, the TA is going to talk about PA3. So, don't lose that. Uh, some of the information that you need, some of the guidelines will be given in the recitations, and you can find them, right? So, uh, the frame table should contain one entry for each of the available frames. Not available, like for all the frames basically in your physical memory. And then it should like keep the uh, information that if this frame is available or not, and if not, which page is it allocated to, right? And again, remember, this is global for all the kernel. It's not per process. And uh, you can use uh, different... Uh, data structures that are available in Pintos. For example, you have hash table, you have bitmap. These are implemented in the lib kernel and you, you should use them. There's no need for, you know, introducing new data structures. And uh, you already learned what a bitmap, bitmap is the bit vector in the free list, right? In the swapping, we learned how, how that works. And it's like very concise because for each page, for example, you can only uh, assign one bit. Um, so that saves a lot of space, right? So whenever you want to allocate a free page, uh, a free frame, you use the palloc get page, and then you will pass in the flag if it's a page that you're allocating to kernel or user. And uh, normally what you're implementing is allocating a page to the user. And the reason is there are two pools in the, uh, for uh, allocating frames. So what does that mean? So the Pintos, whenever you want to allocate a frame to a page, you have limited number of frames, right? So when you start like allocating pages, uh, the, the Palloc already kind of, kind of handles it, and, but it separates it between a kernel pool and uh, a user pool. And the reason is, um, when you start allocating pages, uh, at one point you run out of memory, right? Let's forget about like, you know, virtual memory right now. Uh, if you don't have memory and you can't allocate it, what's going to happen? Then whatever process that is trying to, you know, access or allocate memory, they, they, they cannot, you know, they cannot have it. So you have to terminate or, you know, they, they stop working. Now, you don't want this to happen to your kernel, right? So even if, if a process cannot like allocate memory, that's fine. You terminate it. But your kernel still should keep running. Right? So for this purpose, there are two different pools. So uh, whenever the user processes want to allocate memory, you only allocate from the user pool. So even if you know, the user pool is all gone, you still have some available memory for kernel. In the, in the Pintos documentation, if you read it, I, I think it says like it's half and half. So if you have like four megabytes of memory, that's thousand frames, it assigns almost like a thousand of it to kernel, a thousand of it to uh, user. It doesn't allocate it initially, but it has a pool, right? So how many frames I can allocate? I can allocate 500 to user, I can allocate 500 to kernel. Now when you start like using palloc with the pal user, you start, you know, getting pages from uh, the user pool. And whenever you use the pal kernel, uh, so, uh, you're basically using the kernel pool. So this way, if you're out of the frames for user, this will get you now, but you still have available memory so your kernel can allocate memory for itself, right? So, 
This is the difference between these pools. Okay? Yes. We're actually going to uh, talk about uh, the uh, order of implementation. Uh, I think actually... Uh, mm, well, n yes and no. Because, uh, well, you have to like implement basically both of them. But if you implement supplementary, supplementary page table, you are just like bookkeeping, right? So then you're not like messing up anything. Even with the frame table, that's kind of the same. You're bookkeeping, and once, once you start changing the functionality to depend on those, then things might, you know, crash. So, uh, the frame table is, uh, again, uh, you have to uh, bookkeep everything for frames whenever you allocate uh, pages. So, this, you're going you're gonna, to uh, skip the swapping. So this is for swapping out. Whenever you actually want to evict a page, you... Uh, you have an algorithm to pick a frame on your uh, memory that you don't have any uh, space. So, in, in, in the Pintos documentation, I think it suggests that you implement the clock algorithm because we're going to talk about it the, uh, here. The CPU already access, uh, changes a couple of bits in the page table, so it's easy for you to, uh, to um, basically read the access bits and see if it has been recently accessed or not, reset its... Uh, bits to zero and then give it a second chance just like that uh, and so once you find a, 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 a free frame you have uh, you allocate it you pick it if you don't have a free frame <coughs> you evict the page how is that you go over all the frames in the frame table and then basically find <coughs> access the, the the page table entry and see if they have been recently used or not you reset the bits and then you come back just like the clock algorithm right once you uh, get to a, pay, a frame that hasn't been accessed recently since the last time you, you know, reset the access bit, then you evict that. So, <coughs> you have to be able to find the references to that frame. So, this is the, what your frame table should keep. Each frame is accessed from one of the processes and then in one of the page tables. You have to basically uh, keep the reference there. And then, if it is a dirty, which again is set uh, by CPU in your page table entry, if it is dirty, you have to swap it out. Otherwise, you just like, you know, make it free. So, this is in order to implement swapping out, but you are not implementing it, all right? <coughs> Second is the swap table. Again, in your swap area, you have to ha bookkeep everything, what uh, swap slots are available. If you have swap out some, uh, some of the frames, uh, which process, which pages that are they related to? Uh, <coughs> so th this is basically using like the block swap device, the same way that you create a file disk in, with your uh, Pintos, you can also create a swap disk, and you basically you should ma manage all the swappings. But again, in your PA3, we're skipping this part. Okay. The last part is the memory map files. <coughs> I still want to talk about it again because you might even use it in, in a you know, different project somewhere else. So memory map files is uh, normally whenever you want to access a file, you use read and write you know, from system calls. And uh, this basically has uh, an overhead every time you need to like, you know, call a system call. And it's a slow. Uh, Instead, what you can do is normally, if you want to like, you know, open a file and then you want to do a lot of either reading from it or, you know, you want to read and write to it, it doesn't make sense to, uh, you know, call a system call every time. And also, it doesn't make sense for the OS while the file is being, you know, accessed constantly every time, you know, access an I.O. to the disk, right? It's just like going to take a lot of disk activity, which is unnecessary, Right. You always can have, you have that option if you want like your write to be immediately flushed to the disk. So in case you lose, you know, power or something happens, your data is uh, on the disk at least safe. You can do that. But in a lot of cases, you don't want that, right? You, you, the performance is more important. So memory map file is when you actually load a file into the memory or parts of the file that you want to work with. You load it in the memory. And then once it is allocated to the process, they can basically access those parts of the file directly without the I.O., right? Once the kernel says that, okay, the file is here in the you know, physical memory and you can access it from this virtual address to this virtual address, 
then there's no need for even a system call. Because those bytes, those uh, pages are allocated to the process. So the process can directly access them and changes them. And once it's done with the file, then the operating system can tell, oh, I already have information that I need. Which of these pages are dirty? So I can swap them out to the actual file. It's, the behavior is a little bit uh, different than normal virtual uh, uh, memory and ma- paging, but you, have, you, you get the key point, right? So uh, I don't have the diagram for this, but basically, uh, again, this is the physical memory. The disk, you load a file, let's say you want like, you know, 8 kilobytes of the file and you want a lot of, you know, matrix multiplication or access a huge matrix, you want a lot of data from this, right? You load this matrix from the disk into the memory and then instead of like accessing the file, you know, your input file or output file using I.O., this uh, physical frames are now mapped in the virtual address space here. So the user process can basically have a pointer to them, right? And using the uh, memory map, you can give them like, okay, I want this file that I have opened mapped to this data, right? To this pointer. Now, then you can basically write to this data buffer that you have like, you know, uh, opened and you know, in this example, for example, it just writes the whole thing to the console. So every time, instead of like reading something from the file and then writing to the console, it just maps the whole thing into the bu- uh, buffer on uh, memory and then just writes the whole thing. So this then happens only once. The operating system only opens the file uh, in the memory map, only loads, the, you know, loads it into the memory, and then it's just like direct memory access for the user space and then dumping it to the console, right? So it's much faster. And then you also have a memory unmap, which again, the operating system now free up the available, uh, free up the allocated memory. And if it needed, it will, it has to also, you know, write the uh, uh, pages that has been modified. Again, you are skipping this memory map file. It's a, you know, a huge chunk of your project uh, three, but at least we should understand what the memory map files are. All right, any questions on them? Questions? No. All right, so so just the order of uh, implementation. So the first thing is frame table, because this way you can basically book keep what are the frame tables, uh, what, what are the free frames, and uh, what to do if you don't have free frames. So uh, initially, the Pinchos documentation actually says that, okay, you know, panic the ker- uh, kernel at the initially, but you don't have to do that. Your tests were probably not going to end up uh, losing, you know, uh, memory space. Even if, the, if they do those tests, you don't care, all right? So, you have to uh, change the process that C to use your frame table allocator instead of, uh, you know, be, uh, I think it's not, not using anything right now. So you have to, like, once you implement your frame table, you have to, like, you know, change process to, to use that. Uh, because you're allocating uh, memory for processes, right? So th- you have to now use the frame table, update it, uh, get free frames from, you know, the uh, available frames. Once you allocate frames, then you have to update those frames and basically point them to your pages that you allocate. And uh, after this point, your kernel should still pass the PA, uh, Project 2 test. Almost all of the Project 2 tests, I think 76 of them, are in P, uh, Project 3. Well, of course, with different weights. You remember, the, the tests have different weights. Uh, I, I think the OOM, a couple of boundary tests, they are not part of the PA3. Um, but anyways, so once you do that, uh, your Project 2 test is still should pass. Because again, from the perspective of the process, it doesn't matter, right? Then you implement the supplemental page table, and then you modify the page handler, right? So the the supplemental page table, you uh, you you basically implement uh, what information is needed for the pages that are not in the n- normal page table, and uh, be able to tell that okay, this page is valid, but it's not you know anywhere on the physical memory. So then you can, using that in the page fault handler, you can, instead of like terminating the process, do the swapping or loading 
right? Or extending, uh, ex uh, extending your stack, okay? Uh, so the process that C, whenever you are allocating a page, for example, during a load, uh, this is again something uh, that you can, you already have uh, touched the code, but not probably paid in, uh, attention. So during your load, uh, you, what you're doing is that you, you have the executable file, and in the process that see in the start process and then uh, the load function, you have the load segments. So for a process, you're allocating a segment on the virtual memory, and then this is supposed to be the executable file. So the executable file is a set of instructions, right? Let's say, I don't know, two kilobytes of data, the echo dot, the echo executable, the binary, right? So your load segments right now is basically looking at the disk and allocating one page here, and then reading one page, putting it here. And remember, at this point, it is mapped to a frame. So then reading another page into the physical, one of the frames, basically a contiguous in the virtual address space, right? Next page, next page. So if you have like, you know, 12 kilobytes, if you have 200 kilobytes of binary, then that 200 kilobytes of binary will be allocated in the virtual address space in contiguous way and mapping to 200 kilobytes of physical memory, probably, you know, not contiguous, right? However, this is not the way that we want it to be. First of all, the program is 200 kilobytes. It can be larger, right? And this itself will make it slow. If the, at the start of the process, the operating system just like wants to, you know, do I.O. and then read page by page and page and page, and then that's just like a slow. Second, well, the process might be a few megabytes. You don't have that space in physical memory anyways. Even if you have, the process, uh, the, the instructions of, all of the process is one by one. So if you start at this, you know, this segment, you don't need all the rest of the problem. Right? We talked about it in the lecture. So what we want to do is lazy loading. So this is, you have to implement this and uh, you actually have to modify this, and this is something that we will manually grade, right? Because it might not be visible to some of the tests, but we will check that you have implemented it. So what is lazy loading? So instead of uh, like loading the binary file, right, at the start of the process, the kernel says, yeah, yeah, you have the memory, go ahead, start it, right? Well, obviously, when the process gets scheduled, right, you, the instruction pointer is somewhere in the user pro, uh, the virtual memory, right? So then the CPU starts to access uh, the page that the first instruction actually resides, and then the, the operating system actually has not loaded that page. So then you have a page fault. Then the operating system says, oh, okay, you now want that page to run. It is supposed to be in your code. It is a valid address. I was just too lazy to load it. So now I'll, I will load your binary, but not again the whole thing. Just the page that you need. So I lazily load that page. Now the process can continue run instructions, right? Maybe it has a loop or something. And then it reaches another address that is not allocated, right? Then again, you have a page fault, and then you have to load. So, even if you're not done swapping or anything, still, if you want to implement lazy, uh, lazy loading, which you have to implement as part of your PA3, you have to basically swap in. You don't have the swap space, you don't have the, basically, you know, the swap table or anything, I just call it like paging in. Because what you're paging in is not the swap area, it's actually the binary file of the uh, process. So you have to modify the process at C instead of like loading the whole page, uh, all of the pages into memory. Basically, you don't allocate anything. Only you allocate or do this lazily in the page fault handler. Another thing or another case is the stack growth. So right now, your user has been given one page of a stack right below the fizz base. You have set it up in a set of stack, argument passing, whatever. But you haven't dealt with more than one page. What happens if a process now calls, you know, a recursive function and, you know, the stack just starts growing? Right now, obviously, the, gr the stack will just, you know, overflow and then you have a page fault and because you haven't allocated another page, then your program terminates. This is not the case. 
in, in your you know, operating system, you should be able to tell, okay, just the, pro- the, the process is not allocating uh, you know, some random address. It is the extension of its uh, stack. So instead of like, terminating it, I'm just going to grow a stack to another page. So this, again, should happen in the page fault handler. So take a look. So this is the fizz base, which above this is, you know, kernel space. So this starts the uh, user stack, page number one. So if the virtual address is somewhere along the tip of this, that means that probably they tried to access their own stack, but it was not allocated beyond the first page. So instead of, like, terminating them, I'm going to, like, allocate one more page right here in their virtual memory, and then, you know, let them grow their stack. The user, again, does not have any idea, right? It just, like, tries to call a function. Calling a function has, like, you know, pushing some of the data into the stack. So if the stack pointer is right here, as it tries to push something into the stack, it, then it just tries to access this. This uh, table, uh, it's not in the page table, so it, like, causes a page fault. Now your operating system should handle this, allocate the page table, and then let the, the program continue. Right? So, because the push A uh, instruction pushes like 32 bytes, all the registers, right? So, all of a sudden, uh, and I think the way that the hardware actually uh, implements push A, it in- decrements the stack pointer, then pushes the stuff, right? So, if your stack pointer is right at the border, and the push A function gets called, your stack pointer basically jumps 32 bytes below the, stack point, uh, the first page of the stack and then starts accessing there. So when you're trying to uh, fix the page fault ha- uh, handler to uh, uh, allow a stack growth, you might see valid accesses to up to 32 bytes below the page of your stack. And remember, this is not just one page uh, growth. Once you like grow it to a second page, maybe they do it again. So now you allocate to three page. So somehow you need to also remember where is the bottom of the stack, right? So far I think, I don't think there's implemented in the Pintos, right? So this is the stack growth and it is part of your implementation. So, uh, in the exception that C, there are useful things for you. So the bool not present is true if the page is not present. It's false if uh, it's a writing to a read-only page. So, you remember that the pr- pr- problem of a page fault was when a user pri- trying to access a page that is not available or is not valid. We say it's not allowed to. Why you're not allowed to? Either the page is not present in the page table or it's present but it's marked as read-only. For example, uh, if, if it's a, you know, part of the um, executable binary. It's read-only, but if they try to write to it, then a page fault occurs, right? So, in that case, you still have to terminate the program. But if it's, uh, you know, if it's just like not present, then you have to look at your supplementary page table and see if it's, you know, within the supplementary page table. If it is, then you start like, you know, uh, updating stuff. If not, then you terminate it. Another thing is write. So, you can tell if this access was right or read. So, I... I'm not sure if you actually need it in your implementation of PA3 because you're not implementing, you know, swapping or memory map 5. Uh, access by u- user, access by kernel, I think you may have at least seen it in the PA2 uh, for the safe uh, memory access. Uh, you again want to use this because you only care about the accesses from the user. Your kernel is not trying to uh, basically access a virtual address which is not allocated, right? So, you only probably want to care about the user accesses only. And this one false address is basically the pointer uh, into the virtual address space. So, this is what you're going to use, for example, to see if it was below the, you know, uh, stack page, and then if I should grow my stack, or is it like in kernel space, or is it a null pointer? So, this is what you're going to use, right? And then right there, you can use the uh, palloc get page. This will allocate a free frame, a new frame. Again, of course, you have to have your free, uh, frame table, but this will give, get, give you a frame, and then the page directory set page will let you install this frame into the page table. Okay? So, in the page vault handler, you're going to need this. So, 
Again, these are basically the same as Project 2. You have to use a cert a lot because this implementation can get, a, like, you know, messy and uh, debugging it would be very difficult, okay? So, let's get, uh, skip uh, these to grading. So, when you call make grade on your Pintos, it gives you a, you know, grade. It gives you a, a summary of the test that you fail and pass with the star and then a percentage. Our grading scheme is different. Just know that. You still can see what test you pass but the grade will be different. How different? So these are all the pay, uh, tests for uh, project two, uh, three. So some of them are from the user prog, which is the project two test, which still sh you need to pass and you should not break them, right? Once you start implementing stuff, you might breaking these tests. So you will lose those grades. So you have to, you know, manage that. But for the VM test, there are not so many tests. You have to, I think, like pass six or seven tests, basically, which are like, you know, growing up the stack, and, uh, but you're not like uh, implementing the memory map file test, and uh, these are also the file system tests, again, you still need to pass them. In order to avoid swapping, when swapping happens when you are out of physical memory, so in your configuration of the make, we have modified the memory of the Pintos, instead of like four uh, megabytes, to 16 megabytes. That way, you will avoid needing for swap. So some of these tests start like passing. Some of them still require the implementation of your part to, in order to pass. Okay? So those will be counted. The details of these will be in the PA3 description, which will be released today or tomorrow. And you can start, uh, get, get started with that. So the code that we already give you starts like with 59.2, I think, or 6, right? That's, but that's not your implementation. Just remember that, of course, right? And even if you, like, implement some codes, uh, some, some tests and pass them, and then you fail some other uh, tests, your grade will, you know, change it. So, if you want to know what will your grade be, first of all, you need to manually check the tests that you're passing and the ones that you're failing. And then, of course, they have their own weights. So, we're working on a separate script for grading. So, after calling the make grade, it basically takes a look at the passing test and then tell you what the grade is. Before that, you have to just like, you know, see manually the test in the PA3 description. So, still the 10% of your grade is the design document, which is going to be only some, some parts, not all of it. And the due date is next Friday. So, you have less than two weeks for it. Less work, less time, but right after PA2, just work on them and then figure it out. The source code for PA3 due date is like May 10th. The source code, you'll get like 50% of it just by submitting a compilable code. The base code that we'll give to you, if you submit it, your source code will be 50%. And you won't, you won't get below that. Even you fail, you know, a lot of tests and your grade here will be less than that you will not get less than 50%. But you have to, like, you know, fix those to start, like, getting great. You can get up to 100 if you implement only the tests that we say and then tell you, all right? So once we have the grader, we release it. And, uh, again, the submissions happen in Autolab. You have two, uh, three grace days. Two of them, if you use for this project, PA2, you will have one grace day for PA3. If you use one, you have two. All right? Finish up your PA2 soon, and see you on Thursday. <laughs>